see. Hopefully he should be up. There he is. Oh, yeah. Not, okay. As I mentioned, my next guest is Luis Fernandez Mises, who is the host of Anarchist Espanol, and the uh, next big human is also known as the Libertarian Shaman. Welcome, Luis. Hello. Thank you for joining. Thank, thank you. And thank you for thank your patience. You. Thank you for patient, having me. But. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. And um, yeah, and um, it's, it's a pleasure to have you back on. I've been back on around. Uh, I think it was sometime a little before New Year's last year. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, mainly, of course, we won the. I guess the uh, it's kind of a the start of my, I guess, series, which I started from that called ha- uh, Happiness Causes Freedom, and I thought it would be appropriate to have you on because you're very much into spirituality and uh, you're, as I mentioned, you're known as the Libertarian Shaman. So, and uh, you originally came to anarchism through shaman, shamanism, correct? Or through, you yes. Have, you have the meditation. That, that last part, I couldn't hear you. What was that? Yeah, and uh, so, how, so how did you, so you want to, of course, you know, go ahead and uh, go through how that, that process it seems like there is some sort of echo, and I cannot hear you very well. Okay. Um, okay, you're, I can you, hear you better you now. Better? Okay, yes. I'll just have to keep it positioned close to my mouth. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I was about to say, so you want to go through the process of how you came to liberty through yoga, meditation, and just spirituality? Oh, yes, yes, for sure. Um it's it's kind of a peculiar thing because my mom had uh, done yoga for a number of years before I was even born. So I guess you can tell, you know, you can say that my family has been a little crazy in that path for a while. Um, and uh, growing up, um, I think my my parents kind of raised me in, in a way that uh, I was a little bit uh, anarchist slash uh, nihilist, nihilist. Um, uh, so, you know, from the get-go, it was uh, kind of an interesting upbringing. So I, I've always been kind of uh, curious about shamanism since I was little, and I devoured tons of books. And, you know, in my teenage years, late teenage years, I read all the Carlos Castaneda books, and I wanted to experience similar stuff than that. And, you know, then I, I started... Um, learning yoga and I, you know, went through my certification and in that path I met one of my friends who had already been going through the shamanic path and he invited me um, to partake and so that was um, whenever I started dealing with ayahuasca and some petrocactus and um, I mean at that Let's put that parallel to my actual work. I started working also at uh, at a place where we helped. It was like a social service agency. We helped uh, disadvantaged people. But I saw how that actually disempowered a lot of individuals and they milked the system. And it was kind of a, a vicious cycle. So I went from kind of going, and I will use these words. I, I came from uh, being a socialist, if you will, uh, to you know, being right there, um, witnessing all of this, and then becoming more curious and learning about economics, and you know, then I went and turned into uh, a Republican, if you will. I was like, yeah, this is not working. We should, we need, you know, small government to fix all this. And then, as I kept reading and learning more about it, um, I realized that that I mean, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. I mean, they're kind of like. Uh, just same thing with different names and I found Ron Paul through you know the the conversations that he was having when he was in the Republican Party and kind of the I guess he's the gateway drug to libertarianism if you will yeah. um, he was able to awaken many of us so whenever that happened that's when I started whenever I, I learned about Ron Paul I started reading about him, seeing some of his videos, and then I found Tom Woods. And um, that's whenever I started doing the teaching plans. 
and whenever I was doing the teaching plans, I just like that just blew it off completely and and everything made sense. Everything was perfectly aligned and I was like, gee whiz, this is like I mean it's not the way, but it's a very good way, you know, that uh allowed me to understand how a lot of the dynamics of the universe worked and including, you know, in this physical reality as a the the realization of the non aggression principle and, and all those things. So um I mean in a nutshell, you know, that's kind of how it happened. So, um like how much of a how would you say a role that uh your spirituality helps you in your activism as you promote liberty? Well you know, I was in a ayahuasca ceremony and she let me see how like she showed me a bunch of things and after that ceremony I came out with my life's purpose my life's mission and my life's mission was to be present with everyone and to empower those around me so that's kind of the fuel that moves me that keeps me going uh John okay. Mackey uh C co CEO from Whole Foods he kind of talks about three kind of uh, ways to basically make money, if you will. One is having a job. Number two is having a career. And number three is having a calling. And I think I am fortuitous mm. enough to to have the calling and be uh, actively pursuing that. So. Okay. So I guess, does it, um, do you go from, I guess, from a, you know, your, your activism, do you go from the music from a, you know, is there, like, would you say there's, like, there's a lot more joy in your approach to um to your activism? I, you think? know, that, it's funny that you say that because, you know, before, like, whenever I first saw the reality of the political bullshit, if you will, mm-hmm. I became so depressed and sad and I was like, we need to do something, oh my God, you know. I mean, obviously, we need to do something, but I, I, I was able to shift my focus after my awakening, like the real awakening, um, and, like, life just became bountiful and fruitful, and I just started, like, there's, the secret of life is what we focus on. So if right. we're focusing on running away from the tyranny of government, you know, our brain only only is able to, our, our brain will provide everything that we need. So if we're focusing, and the brain does not understand negatives. So if you say, I want to run away from, you know, tyranny of government, you know, your brain focuses on tyranny of government. And that's what you see. And that's kind of like the, uh, sim- the symbolic number 23 with the discordians. You know, you, you find what you look for. So if you're trying Mm. to run away from all this stuff, then that's what you're going to keep seeing. So I shift my focus. And instead of hating the government and hating all this BS, I started focusing on how can I provide value to others and how can I empower others. And that's a, a virtuous cycle that increases my energy and increases my desire to help. And in a truly voluntary society, the most successful people are those who help the most. Yeah, I would agree. And there's a the quote that usually that comes to mind um, from Mother Teresa. It's um, she where she said, "Don't invite me to an anti-war rally, but um, you know, of course, invite me." But of course, but when you have a pro-peace rally, um, go ahead and tell me I will be there with bells on. Uh, paraphrasing, of course. Because I mean, I think it definitely, it definitely is a lot more. You definitely it's more positive, and you can bring more people, even more attractive, once you're just showing what you what you want necessarily. Then just go ahead and just uh, um, constantly blasting what you're against. In, yeah, in absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, I, I mean, of course, I mean, I think this. Uh, we definitely need some sort of inner peace as libertarians, uh, or of course as anarchists, because it does. It's very hard. I guess it, of course it's after I don't know maybe the first five minutes 
of being of, of being of, of waking up. Of course, and then he he start just he get to the realization that wow, the world is so much uh, so much worse than worse than I thought of. And it, of course, you can there, there can be a lot of anger, a lot of depression, and that seeps into your activism. And then, of course, it, it very and it doesn't really do any good once you start, I don't know, going online and you start going on the street corners or whatever, and just uh, if you just scream at people and say, "Come join me in my depression and my rage," and, and of course, and, and no one wants to really, and, and of course, you don't really gain many converts at that point. Um, yeah, I do think that there is a lot of, um, you know, um, how can I say this? I think that there's a lot of um, people that are actually attracted to that negativity because it brings some sort of purpose. Feeling angry makes you feel alive. It's kind of like a drug, you know, it's it's addictive. So, yeah, there's a bunch of people that are going to like that kind of stuff. But in the long run, it's really not resourceful. I mean, I don't see things as being necessarily good or bad. I see them like, do they hurt you or do they help you? So are they helping you and those around you? Well, not really. I mean, if you're always angry and stressed, that's going to hurt you in the long run. So how can we focus on something that could be, uh, that keep you healthy, that will keep your mind sharper? So, I mean, that's kind of what I prefer. And I think that's pretty awesome that you know, you, you're kind of focusing on the idea of happiness because I think happiness is best achieved when you're looking for it in an indirect way. If you're trying to be happy, it's really hard that you're going to reach that destination. However, if you focus on the things that you like, it, happiness will be a byproduct of that search. And funny enough, it also works for income and, and profit. When we, like... When we look for profit directly, you know, we become profit-driven and we may do some things that are not as ethical, if you will. But if we look for profit in an indirect way, you know, like uh, I was at a conference, Servant Leadership Conference, a couple of years ago, and the former president of Starbucks was there. And uh, I listened to a talk that he gave and and the book that he was uh, talking about that he wrote was, it's not about the cost and it's not about the coffee. So what he suggests is that you put your people first. If people are happy, you know, your employees are happy. You know, when I go to Starbucks, they know my name. They know what I want. They know how I like it. That makes me want to go back. So they're looking for the profit indirectly, and then they make more money. So the same thing happens with happiness. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I, can, I guess I can see your, you can see that point. And um, and I guess and I guess for you guess for active as a libertarian, you could basically you go from the you, would you say you mainly go to say that um, is uh, is liberty I guess in a, in a sense a byproduct of of being happy is that is that what you basically go for as a libertarian and that's what you try to express the people you come in contact with. Well, um, yes, you know, I, I, I do think that um, I, this is I, this one is a hard one. I was actually talking to Adam Kokesh a couple of years ago about this, and he was suggesting that you have to be happy first and then free. And and so, I mean, you mm-hmm. can, you know, make a case for either way, but I think personally that, you know, like I was explaining, happiness is better reached indirectly. So I think that the, the very first advice that I would give to somebody is, you know, make a, a small list and focus on exactly what you want and then go for it. And how can that bring value? And that will bring people happiness. Okay. Let's I mean, okay. what do you I think about it? Um, well, I think with going through my day-to-day basis of, of just uh, – if just trying to promote these ideals, I mean, I notice, of course, that I'm never effective just uh, just trying to prove that with people that they're uh, that uh, that that are not libertarians, that are not, of course, that they're not uh, that they're that they're that I'm smarter than them, that they're just stupid, that they're not getting it. I notice that never 
that doesn't, that doesn't usually get so far. And um, and I guess and it, it goes and of course, but I do use, but I do see just on just a micro microcosmic level in the, the cases on the on the times when I do use it when when I just when I look when I talk to people as just people when I of course and I try and, and just and, and not and just as just fellow look at and just talk to them as fellow human beings and. Um, and just, and just try and be full and be in full and personally with this full be maybe in full of joy that I usually do have some better outcomes in all these cases. Um is you know and I so I could probably so I would say that I so you can probably say that yeah you would have to be happy first in a sense that you have to be in the right kind of the right state of mind before you do go ahead and spread these ideas, these radical ideas, which many people are kind of di- are diametrically opposed to. So, yeah, and you know something that really um, that really baked my noodle was uh, after the awakening, like spiritual awakening, the realization that everything is also me. You know, like when you're talking to another person, that person is you too. So um, how how are you going to treat that person? Are you going to say, oh, this person is such an asshole, such an idiot? Or are you going to be like, you know, stepping aside and be like, this is me too, you know? So how um, how would you treat yourself? Even if that, if that, you know, when we move into the Pygmalion effect, the way we treat others is the way that those other people are going to reflect and react to us. So whenever we treat people with respect and we treat him like, you know, and there's a concept that we teach in the consulting firm that I work with and, and the concept of assuming goodwill. If you approach somebody and, you know, um, Pareto's low, 80-20, 80% of the population want to do a good job at stuff, you know? I mean, they're not like waking up and saying, oh, I'm on, like my goal for today is to screw people over. No, not really. They want to do good work. So if you treat him like that, you're gonna you're gonna get that same response back to you, and then you're gonna speak to their greatness, and then they're gonna grow from that. So basically, yes, you know nobody's perfect, and we all have some sort of lack somewhere. But if we treat people like able people, then they're gonna grow to that expectation and even surpass it at some point. And that is kind of like a ripple effect that brings happiness to you and to those that you yeah. you know you're the per- that you're they're speaking and interacting with. Yeah, um, I was originally, I watched, uh, I just, I think uh, it was just actually just yesterday or, or maybe the day before, I watched a, a study that was done on from on Soul Pancake. I don't know if you've ever watched that YouTube channel. And they did a basic test that eventually they proved that those that, that, sh- that, that show the most gratitude are the most happiness, are the most happiest, so to speak. Or that's the best way to achieve Happiness, that sense by um, and they did it by by showing that once for for those that they did it, they did test they they asked some people that they show the write a letter to those that were the biggest inspiration to them, whatever, and they noticed just automatically that when they did that, I don't forget how exactly how they measured it, but it, it, it's a their level of happiness jumped from like two to four percent. But, and then they had them call them, and the ones that were able to get on there immediately, they got like 14% happier from that angle. Those ones, ones the ones that were talking, those that were able to call the person that inspired them and actually read that letter out loud to them. Uh, that was very cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I think you're right. You know, the idea of. Um um, an attitude of gratitude brings about, you know, a better life. Um, the It's kind of like, for instance, a good example that I could give is like my children, you know. If if they do something mm-hmm. and then I just become like, you know, focusing on the 98% that they did right instead of the 2% that they, did, that they missed, you know, that focus mm-hmm. is going to make them do better or worse, depending on what I focus on. So if I'm always nagging and just focusing on, like, the crazy things that we do when we're little, or, you know, like, okay, 
Yes, you made your bed, and it's probably not perfect, but you did it. So that's good work, good work. The next day, they're going to try, you know, because, I mean, we're going to discourage them if we just focus on the battle. So in the same way, the universe reacts. The universe is a boomerang, and whatever we throw mm. out there comes back to us. So, um, okay. And so is that, and that is, I guess, that's your main, your main approach to parenting? Because I understand you do, um, you, you do, of course, practice peaceful parenting, and you do, you do unschooling as well, right? Yeah, we're actually, yes, unschooling, and um, we, we tr- I mean, nobody's perfect again, you know? Um, right. And I'm not home free by any means, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that I'm, you know, Jesus Christ 2.0, but... I, I mean, we try to do our best, and we try to, you know, I try to say yes as much as possible. And I just remember when I was little, you know, also my dad and my mom were pretty cool too. So uh, I try to keep that in mind and, and how that helped me learn without being afraid mm-hmm. to fail. You know, if we're just afraid of failing, we're never going to learn and we're going to be afraid of, uh, you know, messing up. So, sure, I mean, just to let them know that, yeah, it's okay that, you know, if they're trying something new, do it. And it's okay if you fail. I will be here and I'll help you, you know? And then, sure, right. maybe they fail, maybe they don't, but they're not going to be afraid to try again. Okay. Yeah, that's you, you're saying um, basically from, um, I don't know exactly, like the use of terms behavior or to, um, points, uh, um, problems or whatever, but... I guess from this, if they were to, uh, maybe it's by, by, by your, what you're saying, by just focusing on the positive, though, that's what they usually, by, by, and, you, and you, of course, by focusing on positive and giving them positive reinforcement for that, that's the be, more behavior that they enact rather than, I don't know, if they were to, I don't, I hate to use the word acting out or discipline, let me, of course, be, or, or bad problems. I think yeah. you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Of course, but if you were to, of course, they, they go to more of the, of the positive behavior more than the negative, so to speak. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. Absolutely. Okay. Do you and, have children? Yeah, I'm, I'm sh- no, I do not have children, um, of course, but um, of course I do. Um, well, of course I do, but I do. That's one thing I definitely like to be knowledgeable and uh, have somewhat of an idea before I do have children on that. I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, of course, I've read Dana Martin's book on radical homeschooling. I've had her on the show and very insightful. Um, um, some of the things that, I mean, of course, I do, would question a little bit at me, but, of course, I, I think with this I would probably just have to see it once I'm, once I'm a parent and... Which I, I, try, I can see definitely just by uh, my interaction with her, and of course I watch a lot, a lot, just about almost well, a lot, well, a lot of her YouTube clips, uh, YouTube videos, and see how it really works very well for them as a family. And uh, I think being a, you would probably I just, just by this you would, you would definitely need a positive attitude, a very nurturing. Attitude as, as a, this is, that's what I get from her when I when I've had from her just uh, for five minutes and very nurturing, very positive energy coming from her. So yeah, and that, you know that does not equate the idea that you know everybody gets a medal for participating. No, I mean you're still gonna try no. your best and you're gonna try to be competitive and you're gonna try to out. I mean competitive with yourself. That's what I mean by that. So you know be the best and be better than you were yesterday and. Uh, so yes, I mean you're still gonna have that uh, idea of uh, self-discipline, which is something wonderful. Um, it, 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 by no means, you know, I'm saying that yeah, everything is rosy and you just do what you want. No, you know, we set goals, and we try to achieve them, and there there are conversations okay. that we have with them. So um, also the idea that it's it kind of like creating entrepreneurial minds, you know, um, and okay. that. Uh, I, I use a lot of the coaching that we do at work with them, you know. Um, and again, you know, we can teach something similar to conscious capitalism. And, and what Mackie says about that is, you know, you empower your employees to do what they think it's best 
And if they fail, you do not punish them because they try to do the best they could. You know, it's more like instead of a win-lose situation, it becomes a win-learn situation. So, okay, we did not win here. What did we learn? And then okay. from there you go on. And then you, you, you have your empirical data, you know. Okay, we tried this okay. and it didn't work. And, I mean, it seems it seems pretty organic and pretty resourceful. Okay. Um, so have, um, do you reward them? No, no, no. In this case, is that a little bit different? Um, I guess I know, like, most of them have a, I guess, one, one of these videos, I, I don't know, I think of Dana has mentioned being against the concept of, uh, um, I guess, from, from punishment and reward in this. And I think also Stefan Mall you may mention, I guess you, you would probably, if I was to guess, this, if, I, if I'm, you can go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, you know, to treat them like show dogs, so to speak. I mean, if they were, I don't know, I guess you can probably, if you set, you set goals, but I guess would, would these be like in the same place, for example, I don't know, like potty training or just, are you just, or I guess, or maybe not, that maybe for example, if you not hitting your sister, you get a candy bar or something like that? Is well, that, no, that I mean, we... The kind of and, and every family is going to work different, but the way we do it is, you know, okay. we have our basic things. You know, they have to make their beds, they have to clean their rooms, and that's just their normal stuff. Above and beyond, right. they get other other kinds of uh, um, perks, if you will. You know, like extra TV time, or you know, usage of the iPad, or maybe an extra Netflix show, or whatever they want to do. You know, maybe on the weekend we can go um, to a jumpy house, or whatever it is that they want. Um, but that's only on the above and beyond, you know? So normally we have to do... And see, the thing with unschooling is that we kind of mostly focus on what they want to learn, and we, you create some form of organic house for learning. So, you know, we have okay. documentaries, we have learning toys, you know, didactic stuff. And then I, myself, I'm kind of a geek, so we have these uh, conversations, like my 10-year-old, you know, we were talking about physics the other day, and and like stuff that, quote, cool. you're not allowed in school, quote, you know, because you're too little. So we, we have all these fancy conversations about quantum physics and like chemistry and whatever. And then whenever they find a blocking uh, situation, you know, that means that we have to go back to probably learning definitions of words. So, you know, it's not just learn the definitions of words because you're in fourth grade and you should, you know, it's more like, we have to learn because we're kind of learning something we want and we don't know this word, so it's time to learn, you know? Okay. So I guess a more appropriate example would be, um, like, say, if they're very big in the arts and said, like, if you finish this piece, we'll let you, um, we'll go, we'll enter into this competition, which may give you some award or something like that. Is that more, is that is that right? Would that be more yeah, accurate? Yeah, and... That would be more accurate, yes. Yes, and, and you know, um, I think that also the idea of... Um, I can understand why there's some people that don't do the rewards. And I think the idea is because we want the children to have intrinsic motivation instead of, I am just going, you know, for the carrot on the stick, if you will. So, sure, I believe that there's a lot of that that we do. You know, it's like teaching the idea of virtues. And uh, we do have a lady that comes every Saturday, and, and she does an actual class of virtues, and she teaches a word, you know, like uh, gratitude and, you know, any kind of virtue. So we try to practice it through the week, directly or indirectly. And, and yes, I mean, that works for, you know, whenever we ask them to do something, I'm like, you're not doing that for me, dude. You're doing it for yourself, you know, so don't act like you're doing me a favor. <laughs> So, okay. Yeah, I like that. that so okay. And, so and just and how old are your kids? Ten and six. Ten and six. So you've been doing this for about at least ten years. Well, okay. my ten-year-old started going to school, so she went to a little uh, private school for the first two years. So from four to six, and then. Um, again because okay. I'm always like reading and doing all these things she was like getting into my books and learning all these things so whenever she would go to school she was a little bit ahead and she would get bored even in a private school 
that's supposed to be a little more advanced than the government schools. So the teacher was like, dude, if you just homeschool her for two hours a day, you're going to do more than we do here in six or eight. So I was like, okay, I'm going to save me some wow. money and just, you know, stay at home. So, I mean, that, that worked nicely. That is cool. Um, yeah, I would definitely say, I mean, I guess that... Uh, uh, it's important to yeah remember for listen uh, just remind the listeners that um, unschooling is you know the main per, the main um, the main purpose the main point about that uh, is you know, it's respecting your children's will like um, which uh, of course is like which I like to think with Jeff Berwick uh, does go through the. I guess the main philosophy of unschooling, but his kids want to go to a private school, and he puts them in it because that's just what they want to do. And um, yeah, that's right. And um, you know, I, we fast these guys. I'm like, you guys want to go to school? And they're like, nah, not really. You know, I mean, they do enjoy having their own schedule and not having to wake up when you know, like they're free basically. And and I really love that idea. You know. I mean, we do kind of mm-hmm. have a parameter of like, okay, we have to at least be in our room by 10 and have some quiet time because, you know, we need some quiet time. But, uh, you know, waking up whenever you want to, sleeping when you want to. And, I mean, meals are kind of uh, within a bracket, you know, like here's the window for meals. And, I mean, we do that. It's not just complete disorder. I mean, we do have some sort of semi-schedule. And the socialization, which is uh, sometimes one of the, uh, some people worry about that. There's meetup.com, and, you know, my wife does a really great job in taking them with other on-schoolers, and they have, you know, museum days, park days, play days, and, I mean, all sorts of things. So th- there's a the cornucopia of events that you can go to and learn, and, and yeah. that's always fun, too. And a lot of them are free. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I always hate that, um that that criticism, of course, that you're that's not preparing them for the real world, so to speak. When, of course, when you're when of course it's when your kids are, your example, they're out in the real world every day, as opposed to just um, sitting behind uh, sitting behind in the classroom for six to eight hours a day in cemetery row seating. Just focus, just. Uh, and being pretty much shut out from the world, and not to mention yeah. that you know you being, and of course that's, uh, and just them being so a- age segregated, which of course um, nowhere in the in, else in the quote real worlds do people are people grouped like that. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, it is, uh, but of course, when you mentioned you have a schedule, I guess. Well, how does that is that easily enforced? No, I mean, if, um, do they just do it because just to meet their to meet their because um, that's uh, because they trust you to uh, that you have good advice that you have good advice and that you're doing for their best interests and that we well, can say well, Daddy's set the schedule for us and we're going to go follow that or do you do it from I guess some type of reward system as you mentioned or. No, on that one, we, we do say, all right, dude, I'm tired. I need to go to sleep. I need to wake up early. So uh, either go to your room and you read a book or just, you know, it's silent time. And they're like, okay, whatever. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty relaxed okay. in that fashion. Uh, if we do have to wake up early, we'd say, you know, we have, I mean, for instance, um, this weekend we're going to go see a relative like five hours away. So we're like, okay, we have to wake up at 5 a.m. to be able to drive and all this. So we have to go to sleep early. And they're like, oh, yeah, I mean, we do travel some. And they know that, you know, whenever, I mean, they, they've experienced the fact that, um, I mean, we do let them fail, if you will, you know. Okay, don't go to sleep. Mm-hmm. You're going to be really tired in the morning. And then they try it and they see that they're all fuzzy and they don't like that. So next time, you know, they know. Yeah, I, 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 you're right. I should go to sleep because I don't like, you know, being, I mean, nobody likes not sleeping. So, you know, they, they, they learn from experience and, and they know. So they trust me because they, and they trust my wife because of that same reason. You know, they've been in that situation. Um, so the the waking, um, they normally don't do anything before 10 a.m., you know, so they have time to wake up, take a shower, eat some breakfast, 
and then they go do whatever. My wife stays at home, so they have that ability. Now, another thing is people freak out and they say, I am not prepared or smart enough to be able to teach my kids about X, Y, Z. Well, you don't mm-hmm. have to. There's a ton of resources, and a lot of them are even for free. You know, we use Khan Academy, one of them. And that guy is awesome. And he knows a lot about a lot of things, and he does it for free. And you just make an account, and, you know, he keeps a tally on your scores or, or you know, like all your tests that you take and whatever. So you can see the progress of your kid. And another one, I mean, Minecraft is amazing. <laughs> uh, Ron Paul has the okay. curriculum. Um, I mean, Wikipedia, I mean, the public library, and again, the meetup groups with some parents, and they, you can form a co-op of sorts. I mean, there's a ton of things that people can do. Yeah, I would say so. Um, and, yeah, I, I would say, I, I would... Um, Definitely, and of course, I don't see any other way to, of course, uh, to raise your kid in that sense. I mean, um, I've got the right word for it, but I don't like to use the words raise or discipline or speak because that does go against the whole the whole point. So I, yeah. So um, okay, there are now I'm on cue. Says I'm not connected. Can you hear me, Louis? No. Louis? I I can hear you very well. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. My I, I lost I got I got off the studio real quick, and now it's fixed. All right. So and uh, I guess you, you see a, a difference in just uh, in that and in, in just the way that you were brought up. Well, and, I mean, um, yes, I was uh, brought up in in um, in a really. Um, I mean, there were rules, there were things that needed to be enforced. I was spanked, and so it was really different. But still, um, my parents were pretty um, pretty relaxed on many, many, many things. Um, I can tell you that, I mean, without – I'm not a, a huge fan of, like, doing a lot of comparisons, but, um, you know, sometimes you have to. These guys versus their peers on around their age – you know, I've been told by many, many people that come to our house or when we go places, they're like, oh, my gosh, they seem and act so maturely and they are so smart. And, you know, the idea that they're hanging out with their parents a lot makes make them uh, hear and see and experience things that they would not experience if they were just in you know, with, you know, like you mentioned, sitting on a desk listening. I mean, I hated school, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, it, it's not fun to be, like, there for so many... Uh, my favorite part of school was recess. Mm. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. So these guys have the ability to um, have more freedom. And, and the, like I was saying, the entrepreneurial mind, which is pretty sweet. That's cool. And uh, do you see it... What do you, what do, you see it, do you see it as a realistic strategy, as in, um, for, I guess, do you think this would eventually just uh, weed statism out of the human psyche eventually? Um, Uh, Yeah, I think so. I think it's happening. I think it's taking place already. I think that we, I mean, we may not necessarily see it in our lifetime, but there's a lot of free people. And not just that, but um, at work, I I happened to go to a a conference probably uh, like four months ago, five months ago. It was a CEO conference, and it was 200 CEOs from some of the best, you know, like you you have your Chipotle, your Whole Foods, your, I mean, uh, container store, all these guys. And what they were saying was so amazing. They were saying, you know, government sucks. We cannot necessarily expect government to solve the problems. We, as conscious enterprises, need to take over what the government is not doing and empower society. So they're not just thinking about, I mean, like, again, the idea of going after the profit in an indirect way. You know, they're going to empower the society, they empower the, the circle around them, you know, basically seeing the enterprise as another citizen that is responsible instead of just, um, you know, like, anyway, I don't want to necessarily throw other unconscious businesses, but 
So these guys are doing it. And imagine if 203 CEOs are thinking in that same fashion from some of the biggest mm-hmm. and best companies in the world. I mean, that's happening already. You know, that's so exciting in our lifetime. So I don't know how long that will take. But to me, I mean, I was like so excited to hear that. And that's, yeah, and I think just seeing, um, of course, getting back to happiness being our underlying goal and that being you know, our goal or that we force being and this, this liberty being a byproduct of that. I mean, you can just uh, imagine, I think, if libertarians were to really focus in on the on peaceful parenting and unschooling and, and we could show the world that... Um, Essentially, of what this is, what this can bring, just for um, just for the rest of society. Though I think, in, in libertarians' were just be we're on the forefront of this, advancing this. I think this would be a lot more um, productive in, ter- in terms of just gaining con- converts than um, than the Rand Paul campaign or, or Gary Johnson or just any any other. Any you know, other political campaign here yeah. in, I guess, 40, 50 years. And so yeah, we might I, I agree. be able. Yeah, so we. So I think so it's, so it's very exciting. I think as more, and this can have a potential of just. of, deal, of doing or of just advancing, we can probably have a majority of. Uh, of actual of, of people being, uh, like maybe half the society, half the country. Being libertarian in just a generation, if um, at least, and then of course and yeah. then we might and we might eventually have, have a free society. We have a free society in our lifetime. So, but see, I exciting. think that something that I really like to think about is not to even worry about that. Just to, you know, uh, to live life, you know, be free in an unfree world, if you will. Just like right. I think that we could make so much improvement. If we really, really, really just ignore the government and ignore all these things and just, you know, there was one, um, you know, the law of Salima, do as thou wilt, but be prepared for the consequences. Or in, in other words, like the Discordians, you know, my friends say, um, liberty is what you can get away with. You know, no cop, no stop, if you will. So how can you live right. a, a life where you don't hurt others, but you look for um, your happiness and those around you? So just I would it agree really that, irrelevant. Uh, and that and that does um yeah I think so it's uh that's kind of reminds me that's something what, what Derek Freeman had mentioned when I in his when I had him on the show about a month or so ago and uh it basically well, when we had to or asked him a problem which asked him well how the the locals if they or how they would catch on to this idea which my well, kind of response to that. Is uh, is I, I definitely get what you're saying, but you know, we, what, what do you do with if we have the just people around you, kind of that aren't really for that uh, they don't see the benefit and they don't have a problem imposing their will on you. How, how do you live your life like that if uh, we don't count if we don't if we don't uh, if we're not ca- uh, counteractive against that mindset? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I I completely understand what you're saying, and and I, you know, there's always going to be that. So I'm not saying it does not exist, you know, and you're mm-hmm. there's not going to be repercussions, or you're not going to find uh, mean people. So I think that the idea is to live as free as you possibly can with a really, um, like, again, going back to the focus, what are we focusing on? What do we really want? Not, let's not focus on what we don't want. What do we really, like, do we have permission to go after what we really want? A lot of people don't give themselves permission to go after it, and that's why we are kind of uh, in that pickle, because we don't know that we can. So I think that a very important exercise is just, you know, to look at ourselves in the mirror and <laughs> I'm sorry, and say to ourselves, you know, I really give you permission to go after your dreams, and I mean that that that's really powerful stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, so you're basically um, just saying, well, we'll worry about the mean people 
if and when that comes, but we can still try to, we can still work on being, just living our lives as we can. I mean, of course, you make, let the mean people be a secondary thoughts, if you will. Exactly. Which are basically yeah. Saying, right? I mean, exactly. I still carry my AR-15 in my car, you know? I mean, I'm not blind to the right. idea that something can happen. So plan for the worst, but, pre- you know, prepare for the worst, but plan for the best or something like that. You know, like have your, your, your mentality on like a high goal. But if it doesn't happen, have a plan B too. So, you know, you can, like, the, the idea is that a lot of people live in an either-or world, mm-hmm. but... The world is not like that, you know. I, I, I don't like those kinds of false dichotomies. I mean, I think we can live in a world of both and, you know. You can have both. Why not? You know, what stops you? Yeah, you can plan for the best and, you know, sometimes have poopy days. So it's possible. Right. Yeah, I definitely do see that. And um, so I guess we get... Um, So I guess we. It's a, I, I guess we. If we you, have, you have a few more minutes. Yeah, I have a couple more minutes. Okay. So um, right now we'll get in touch. We'll, I guess for what is a what would be a I guess a proper response in dealing with situations like what's happening in Baltimore right now with the police uh, brutality, a lot of riots and such, which that is a. Uh, well, that well, I should mention. Well, that's what is uh, not. That's what's mainly being focused on, though. But I mean, how can we readdress this and hopefully, st- I guess, uh, st- maybe, I mean, of course, and work towards a world where that is not an issue, rather than just being angry and upset. Well, I think that it's okay to feel angry. I think it's okay to feel sad, you know. Um, I think, again, we need to give ourselves permission to feel because we're pretty um, disconnected with ourselves. So now, what do we do with that anger? It's a different story, you know. I think Viktor Frankl says it really nicely. Between stimulus and reaction, there is a gap. And in that gap, there is freedom. So in other words, when something happens, you don't have to automatically react in the way that you were taught you can pause and then choose consciously how to respond instead of react. So, yes, Mm -hmm. police brutality is something that's taking place, but personally, I don't think... I mean, I don't don't like the cops, honestly. So, I mean, if... So, I mean, that's kind of a pickle, you know? I I don't like them. Um, But at the same time, uh, I don't think that destroying private property is going to solve the problem. I mean, if they're going to riot, I think at least they should focus and direct their anger towards the ones that created this bullshit instead of innocent people. I mean, I'm not suggesting that they should go ahead and burn the police station by any means, but, you know, I mean, if they're going to do something, do it against the ones that did it. Uh, Otherwise, I think there are more constructive ways, you know, like instead of doing this kind of stuff, you know what, I mean... Stop paying taxes, you know? I mean, the root yeah. problem. What is the root problem? The government. Yeah. It's not, It's not. I mean, your neighbor, it's not, I mean, whatever. Most, like 99.9% of the problems in life that we have are due to some sort of government regulation or some law. So people don't necessarily know that they can be free. So the root problem is the state. So stop paying taxes, you know? Like, I'm, I... I don't even pay my freaking red light camera tickets, you know? I mean, screw that. Um, yeah. Start the beat. Well, yes, would you, you know, of course, it'll be good once you take it to court and just tie them up in time. And maybe, um, of course, when more people would join that, maybe they would just uh, stop repeal those laws. And um, I would, I don't know, I mean, of course, of course, you know, as much as you just said you, you're not worried towards violence, I would suggest go and, when you go there, and when you take it to court, you should request a trial by combat, and um, see where that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and for instance, I think <laughs> that um, the the idea of politics is, uh, you know, I'm an anarchist, but I I, I do believe that I'm, I'm kind of uh, on the same page as Rothbard that we need to use the Libertarian Party as a tool 
instead of seeing it just another arm of status. So, for instance, mm-hmm. I'm also involved here in the local chapter. I'm, I'm part of the um, executive committee here with the Liberty and Party. And we're actually getting rid of the red light cameras, you know. It's already on the ballot. Nice. We're working there, and we're, I mean, we're getting them out. So, yes, uh, we hate the government. What can we do about it? Let's, you know, I think that it's a good idea to work in different arenas, and one of them being the Libertarian Party. I think that's great. Yeah, I would say so. Um, which, I don't know. Of course, I had the, I was in the middle of starting one, but, of course, a lot of uh, a lot of my libertarian friends, uh, of course, weren't weren't as much interested in me you know, as as I was. So, and it was probably big to just take on myself. I don't know. I might try again. But of course, I, I might have to reevaluate those priorities. I had plans of moving eventually to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project, but I might stick around a little bit longer. I have to reassess that. I would say, yeah, that the Libertarian Party is a good uh, avenue for, um, you know, for, for at least being uh, as a soapbox issue. And you might, and you might, of course, in, in local issues, in like local ballot, push local ballot issues, you might be able to make some good. Um, not so much on the, on the, on the federal level, though, but. Yeah, I agree. There is like local zero level. control over uh, stuff beyond the local level. So yes, we can and will get rid of the red light camera here. Uh, so that's something that we can do. It's not something that, you know, like wishful thinking. I think that a lot of people really, um, you know, and, and I, I was there too, so I cannot say that I've always been free of this. You know, we feel so disempowered that we want to blame something else for what's happening instead of looking, mm-hmm. how can I contribute to the resolution of this this problem? So we move again from one perspective to the other, and then we become an asset. And then people seek you out, you know? And, and then you have mm-hmm. to... Um, I, I think there's like three main verbs uh, that really constitute the, the image of a person. One of them is, you know, be, and then do, and then have. A lot of people want to go to the have first, but that doesn't work. You have to be, you know, which is like reading, cultivating yourself, and, and that's how you become an asset. And then by virtue of being, you start doing, you know, to know the good is to do the good. And then when you're doing all these wonderful things, you start having things. So I think that's also part of the process of happiness that we start talking about. Whenever you feel really good about yourself, you know, because of who you are, not necessarily about what you have, because, you know, when we die, we don't take anything. So who you are ought to make you happy. So if we're not happy with life, I think that we should look inside and see how we can become that instead of trying to fix the outside first. That's pretty deep, bro. And uh, I, I definitely do agree. I mean, um, and say def- when I was, of course, and there, there's a lot of, and there's, a, there's, I mean, many ways once you're actually proactive and stopping, there's even, even something as a political process and, uh, and of course, when you, and you get when you get when of course when you do have when you're surrounded with, by like-minded people that are focused on this cause, um, it's like as I was in the Ron Paul campaign. There is really not a very few things that make you as happy with that. I mean, and uh, I'm sure I'm just you probably get the same experience when you're probably working with people that with. I don't know. Pro- what we're working just when there's people, just people that in just a very few short months or whatever, you feel like you've known them for ten years or so, and there's no, there's not quite a feeling like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. And. Uh, and I can see definitely how these are, and I like definitely how you take this approach. You seem like you're a jack of all trades. You seem to be covering all the other avenues of activism, whether it be peaceful parenting, you know, the political process, and in the entrepreneur, in the in the in the business world as well. And you can see how definitely how you can bring all these people in from different avenues, like maybe. Um, just as you're enjoying life and you're doing this from um, 
I guess when you're, you're doing your meetups for your with your with your homeschool or unschool parent uh, um, parents in them, you can get them introduced to libertarianism and and, and same with the 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 business world as as well. So yeah, I I think that uh, that's you part of being. Make a, you make, sorry, okay. is it very common? Do you, have you made inroads in these different camps or? Um, have I made what? I'm sorry. Have you made inroads into these different circles within, uh, you know, homeschool parenting, like in, in bringing people into the Libertarian Party, into the Libertarian Party, as well as you know from the business worlds, into uh, into your involvement. You know, in I politics? think. Um, short answer: Yes. Uh, yeah. Long answer: um, the, the, We attract. Like, there's only a few things that we can actually control in life. And fortunately, you know, it's basically your focus. And what you focus on also yeah. helps you attract people and circumstances. So, yes, I've been able to attract some awesome people that become curious and they like the idea and they adopt it. And then again, it's kind of like fractals, you know, or, or tuning forks. So th- this is a chain reaction that just happens really, really uh, uh, amazingly. Um, so they... I think one of the very important things is, and you mentioned it, nobody really likes when somebody is extremely negative and and whatever. So on the other hand, if they see you um, happy and successful and and, uh, just, you know, going towards things and making things happen, then people become curious and they come and ask, you know? So that's whenever... um, uh, on that, I think I've really um, learned a lot from uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Like he's uh, he's okay. probably the happiest man man on earth. You know, he's always talking like if, you know the sky may be falling. You know, and he could be like, oh, now we're closer to God. You know, like his focus is just so freaking amazing. He can be like oh, yeah. in the worst and situation, and he always pulls out something good out of it. Or just, or guess like, or just pull, or just uh, do. A, Maybe you can write an article of him pouring a bowl of cereal and just like, oh, look, this represents anarchy and it's beautiful. And <laughs> or like, or talk about light bulbs and stuff, and it's like, it's very passionate about it. And I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. It's, so you yeah, know, people like that. that. And not just that, but, you know, like you mentioned, not wanting to make yourself look smarter or better, but if you speak in a way that everybody can understand you and if you make people feel appreciated, they're going to want to hear what you mm-hmm. say. So I think the yeah, secret it, word is trust. Is what? Trust. Is trust? Okay. Yeah, if people trust you, they're going to hear what you have to say. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's I, I, I personally think that it's really like, I mean, unless you're playing client golf, you know, you don't really play with those that you don't trust. So hmm. how can you play, you know, and have fun and learn and explore and expand and grow? I mean, it's by basically trusting, you know? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, and it's in getting that in person negativity. You, of course, uh, I am this watching I was just watching one of the um speech Adam Kokesh just made back on his uh, American um uh, camp uh, campfire tour or whatever it is. Um uh, but it's uh, basically it's kind of like you know when we when we when on the advents when we when we discover when the first people that promoted indoor plumbing or basic hygiene or whatever, they didn't go around to people and say, You you're so stupid. Why are you of course uh uh, don't, don't you realize that this makes you so much cleaner? This and the other, it's more like, hey, would you like to not smell so bad? Is like, and um, or like, it's like, and here you should you should really try this and have this yeah. in your house. I mean, of course, it's, um, but of course, if we, I'm like, and that would be so much more effective if we were to um, just apply that to the ideas of liberty. Absolutely. And, you know, another tool that we teach at work uh, is uh, teaching by example. 
So uh, one of the CEOs that we work with, his name is uh, Jack Lowe. He is uh, owner of TD Industries. He said something that really stayed branded on my brain. He said, uh, he was giving an example of the story, and he said, what What are you saying? I cannot hear you. Your actions are speaking so loud that I cannot hear wow. what you're saying. So in yeah. other words, you can tell people, you know, day and night, and you can recite the Bible, but if you like, or, or the Torah, or, or you know, the Bhagavad Gita, but if you don't act it, you know, it, it's pointless. So yeah, how can I'm we uh, inspire? How can we help others learn? And how can we learn from others? Is whenever we trust, you know, like if I trust you, I am more apt to hear what you have to say versus if you're just coming and tell me, "Please, oh, you're such an idiot. You shouldn't do it like this." I'm gonna be defensive and not want to hear what you say. But if, you know, mm. there is a relationship of trust, and I think that, yes, it takes longer because it's kind of one-on-one, but it is so fruitful. And, again, we go back to the ripple effect. Okay. And I should ask, uh, since we've been talking about, you know, your your experience in the business world, what exactly do you do, if I may ask? Uh, we, yes, yes, uh, we help executives and directors to okay. – it's kind of like volunteerism in, in the corporate arena – So we help them to move away from command and control and into servant leadership. So Hmm. the idea that you as the boss or the supervisor or the owner, you're not there to bark and tell them, you know, necessarily what to do. People already know what to do. So here's the task. And now, you know, the pyramid of power turns upside down and the, the boss says, how can I support you and remove blockages so you can do your work? And that works in, in, in two ways. Number one, you empower your employees to think and act um, much better and at high, a higher level. And it also gives you, as a supervisor or boss, time and efforts to focus on higher level tasks. So it's a win, win, win. And that happens, you know, you make more money in that way. So, yeah, I mean, that's I, what we do. And, you know, I of course want to reiterate this, that that is not altruism by any means. I know, of course, I believe we um, talked a little bit about last time you were on about objectivism, objectivist principles, but I should mention that you're not being necessarily sacrificing your values or your ends by doing by help by, by like like you said by helping people, so to speak. As in your this is helping your end goal of success of you reaching your happiness. No, so. absolutely, and I think it helps everybody. So you know, yeah. I think part of the developmental stages of man is focusing on I first, and then you move to we, and then you move to all of us. So whenever your developmental stage goes to the idea of all of us, as an individual, you're able to see that we all are interdependent. We all are connected. It's not linear by any means. It's a system, a really complex system, where to be able to be really successful, I have to help you, you know? So sure, it's it's a win-win. It's not necessarily just a selfish act, but at the same time, like you said, it's not altruistic by any means. I'm not just doing it because I want, you know, I'm selfless. No, I want to eat too, and I want a fancy car, and I want to continue to purchase designer clothes. Why not? But at the same time, I want you to be super successful too. Yeah. So, yeah, which we can say, I mean, most, uh, I think, objectivists would agree with that principle, they, on their, which uh, other than you can say for open objectivists, as opposed to clothes, that basically are just Randian. Whatever. Um, we've, uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Kelly wrote a book uh, called, um, which I think the a, a rugged individuals in which he which he does a he which he which he put which he which he basically he, he excels the the principle of benevolence though and how helping people does which has that that can in principle what you can use based off you have your self interest. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's what yeah. basically what I have to Yeah, I, I mean uh, I I you know, a lot of people think that capitalism is a zero sum game and I, I, mm-hmm. I disagree completely. I think it's a win 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 game. You know, where you win and then the other party wins and then 
the community wins and then the planet wins and every everybody wins, the environment wins. So this is an ideology that will eventually unite the right wing and the left wing because we all are in it together. You know, there, there are no sides in a round world. Right. So how can we be able to interact with each other regardless? I mean, we all have different likes and different fancies and different ideologies, but we still need to relate somehow. We need to cooperate. So that's kind right. of the idea. I, I definitely get what you're saying. Um, yeah, which I would, I would say that, and I definitely I, I agree wholeheartedly, is that you do have to, it does, by being yeah, self-interest-minded, you, know, you would have to be able to relate to people. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah and to. also, you know, the idea that uh, being being uh, humble enough to maybe consider that probably we don't have all the answers, you know? So yeah. the idea that we can learn from others, the idea that, I mean, I am uh, a non-dualist, you know? I, I, I don't believe in a deity, for instance. But I can, have, like, I have really good friends that are Christians and, and Hindus and whatever, like, you know, and... and I'm friends with freaking communists, you know, like, on, and, and like, I, 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 think, I think that's the idea that the, to, to be able to connect every level and, and not because of, of, yeah. of the idea, like you mentioned, that we think we're better or whatever, but because I, I, I think I can learn from everybody. Everybody has something to say that I can learn from. But, so I guess... Um... So you're not so you're not on the love I guess you, so you're not a big fan of I guess the the strategy of defooing I guess uh, I guess uh, just uh, other people I guess or we can say or, or status or just people that are just a very, very extreme of, of, of opposed ideology so which I would say I mean, of course definitely not. In this case, but I guess maybe if they if they were exa- exactly just to, if they were beyond the doubt just uh, going to be toxic to your life, let's just speak. If they're abusive and they're just eternally emotionally draining, then maybe you might that might be on the I guess on the table of disconnecting them. But I mean, yeah. But of course, but I guess for this, I would say from. Uh, but of course, you, you don't want to be. You don't want to have your finger on the D food trigger too quickly, so to speak. And you want to be able to grow, or and not and not necessarily. I would say you should. I guess in most, in, I guess in most circumstances, not even have that on the table. Yeah, and then we go back to sense. the idea of assuming goodwill. You know, the idea yeah. that you're not necessarily out to get me. You know. Mm-hmm. I think that 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 um, every man sees the world with what he or she has, you know, in her heart. So, like, if you see conflict everywhere, you know, I mean, wh- that comes from somewhere, and that's usually inside. So, how can we change that? How can we? Because then again, that takes us to happiness. If we're just seeing conflict everywhere, mm-hmm. I mean, we're not happy. We're angry. We're afraid. So, mm-hmm. and then this goes. Like, we can link this back to science, you know, the brain and hemispherecity. And if we tend to be, like, really uh, alienated and um, we're uh, levelizing, we're just going towards one hemisphere really heavily. So the idea of, uh, like, um, peace and and collaboration and all this, it really includes both hemispheres and uh, connected through the corpus callosum. So um, one thing to get there is meditation, you know. Breathing exercise, yeah. just exercising Absolutely. naturally. So. Absolutely. And I would say is that we do have a uniting message that can bring, you know, a lot of, of course, a lot of people together. Just, I mean, of course, even your communist friends, so to speak, if, you know, of course, that we can have it as long as it's, that we, that we can have that coinciding with, with, uh, with us as long as it's voluntary. So, and so we don't have to, and so we can unite people. We don't have to push people away. If, you know, we can just bring people along, along those, on the, just, just agree on that, which 
I think it is very attractive. Just do what you do, you know, as long as you don't hurt people, as long as you don't force people along. Yeah, and I think that would humble a lot of people, though, after it's presented that way. Yes, yes, sir. And I, um, I think that having a, a different array of friends also helps you uh, see the world in, in, in a more uh, broad way and helps you see a bigger picture and it helps you understand others. Whenever you're, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Seven Habits, and I think one of them, I don't know if it's four or mm-hmm. five, is uh, uh, listen to understand and then to be understood. So whenever you're able to understand others, uh, you're 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 connecting in a way that uh, allows the two of you, um, the two of us, to to have better understanding and then you know less conflict. So I mean, it, it's it's um, it's I think it's more resourceful. It's easier to live like that, I guess. Mm-hmm. It does take a good level of emotional intelligence to be able to do that, you know, because like some people, yeah. you know, may may see like, oh, this guy is a right winger, you know, he's probably, you know, uh, uh, xenophobic, uh, whatever. You know, let's not label. Let's see first. Let's understand where they're coming from. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe yeah. that's the reason why they're afraid, you know? So how can we help them see that there's no reason to be afraid? How can we help other people, do, you know, like, for instance, I am from Mexico. And a lot of people, you know, like have some ideas of what that may you know, what I should do or not do, you know? Yeah. So how can we help people dispel those mistaken ideas? Because a lot of times they're, they're mistaken, yeah? So, and we all have them. We all have our paradigms, our mental models. So by understanding others, we understand ourselves even more, too. Beautiful. And, um, let's see. You, so you've, uh, so you've had even, uh, Having gone for about an hour plus, uh, you can go save no longer than ten I'm cool. But is there anything else you'd like to touch on? Well, I think that uh, we've had a really great conversation. I just want to invite everybody that is listening um, to this conversation to go probably check out Emancipated Human on Facebook. And also cool. I have a YouTube channel um, that is probably now a year old. So um, I would really appreciate a lot of views and uh, shares and comments on the page. And, you know, I'm Luis Fernando Misses on Facebook, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to okay. accept friendship and to conversate. This, this show, does your show go on, does, it, does you have a, a new episode every, I guess, in a, in a specific time, or is it um, well, you just do a bit? I... I do one every two weeks, and I don't really have a set day. Um, so, okay. you know, I mean, that that's almost like a full-time job. So I, I try to, uh, I mean, I have a lot going on, as you know. So um, oh, yeah. I, I try to do it uh, every other week. So it gives me also some time to spend with um, the family. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I have some, uh, some fun cool. uh, guests that... Uh, you know, we're very, very different stuff. It's not just, like, always a focus on some specific thing. I mean, I have anywhere between, you know, a former CNO that talks about Fukushima to, you know, a, a sex coach to a shaman to, oh. I mean, all sorts of everything. So we, we I mean, a little bit for everybody. So who do you have on for your next uh, episode, on the upcoming episode? You know, I just published... Um, the one with my teacher, my shamanic teacher, Alberto Roman. I just published that this uh, this week. So um, it already has like 113 views in a couple of days, so that's kind of neat. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, people that are really curious about ayahuasca and San Pedro, and him and I have a little good conversation there. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really neat one. And then, you know, last time I had uh, Mike Blevins. He used to work at, a, at the best power plant in the United States and um, I got to interview him. He, he was the chief nuclear officer and um, I have a Jake Shannon, you know, hypnotist, mentalist, pretty awesome, Discordian. Um, and then we have a intimacy relationships with a couple of sex coaches. They're really amazing women. 
So, I mean, there's there's a lot of videos. I have Doug Casey. I have uh, Jeff Berwick. I have a couple with Jeffrey Tucker. So, I mean, there's um, a lot of good stuff in that channel. Cool. And do you still do Anarchist, uh, Espanol? Yes, I do that one. Okay. And that one, I, tr I it's a little bit more difficult. And I, I do once a month on that one. Okay. Uh, and and this, uh, I just interviewed uh, a woman that um, she is the vocalist, the lead singer of, um, of one of the most popular rock bands in Spanish. So this is kind of a, a big deal. Cool. Uh, she's uh, yeah, that, that was kind of cool. And she just you know started posting on her page about being an anarchist and being anti-government and this and that. And I was like. I have to have you in my show. And she's like one of the nicest people ever. She said, heck yeah, man. So um, actually they're going to be here in Dallas in a couple of weeks, and they invited me to their show. So that will be fun to get to meet them. Cool. All right. Thank you Anything for inviting else you'd like to yeah, look, Okay, no. Lexi, we'd love to have you on again. Of course, yeah. of course, anytime. Thank you so much for this. I really enjoyed it. My pleasure. All right. You have a wonderful night, man. You too, sir. Be well.